Good afternoon. As you know, this country is engaged in the biggest and fastest vaccination programme in our history, and the chances are that you know someone personally who has already received a vaccine. But it would be fatal if this sense of progress were now to breed any kind of complacency, because the pressures on the NHS are extraordinary. On Tuesday, we saw 4,134 new admissions to hospital on a single day, the highest at any point in this pandemic. There are now more than 37,000 COVID patients in hospital across the UK. And in spite of all the efforts of our doctors and nurses and our medical staff, we're now seeing cancer treatments sadly postponed, ambulances queuing, and intensive care units are spilling over into adjacent wards. And with 55,761 positive cases since yesterday, and very sadly, 1,280 deaths, this is not the time for the slightest relaxation of our national resolve and our individual efforts. So please stay at home, please protect the NHS and save lives, and please remember that this disease can be passed on not just by standing too near someone in a supermarket queue, but also by handling something touched by an infected person. And remember also that one in three people with COVID have no symptoms, and that's why that original message of hands, face, face, washing your hands is as important now as it has ever been. And it's precisely because we have the hope of that vaccine and the risk of new strains coming from overseas that we must take additional steps now to stop those strains from entering the country. So yesterday we announced that we're banning flights from South America and Portugal and to protect us against the risk of as yet unidentified new strains we will also temporarily close all travel corridors from 0400 hours on Monday. Following conversations with the devolved administrations, we will act together so this applies across uh, the whole of the UK. This means that if you come to this country, you must have proof of a negative COVID test that you have taken in the 72 hours before leaving, and you must have filled in your passenger locator form, and your airline will ask for proof of both before you take off. You may also be checked when you land and face substantial fines for refusing to comply. And upon arrival, you must then quarantine for 10 days, not leaving your home for any reason at all, or take another test on day five and wait for proof of another negative result. And we will be stepping up our enforcement both at the border and in country. And it's vital to take these extra measures now when, as I say, day by day, hour by hour, we are making such strides in protecting the population. We've now vaccinated over 3.2 million people across the UK, doubling the numbers of last week. That's 2.8 million people in England, 225,000 in Scotland, 126,000 in Wales, and 115,000 in Northern Ireland. Yesterday alone, we vaccinated around a quarter of a million people in England, and that is still far more than any other country in Europe. And with almost 45% of our over 80s now vaccinated, and almost 40% of care home residents, we are steadily protecting those most at risk. And I pay particular tribute to the vaccination efforts going on in Cockermouth in Cumbria, Yately uh, in, and Cheltenham, uh, where they vaccinated around 90% of their over 80s uh, in their communities. And I uh, also pay tribute to Northwest Lincolnshire, to Sunderland and Morecambe Bay, where vaccination teams have protected over 80% of their care home residents. And it's thanks to that amazing constellation of the vaccination teams, doctors, nurses, uh, armed forces, local authorities, pharmacies, volunteers, that we're steadily building up that immunity, that protection for the vulnerable, for the NHS, and for us all. So when the call comes, please do get a jab. And in the meantime, stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. And I'm now going to hand over to Chris Whitty to do the slides. Thank you, Prime Minister. First slide, please. 
Um, the just three slides this evening. The first one um, is the number of people testing positive for COVID. Uh, and what you can see uh, on this slide is the number is extremely high. We're still at the place where uh, just shy of one in 50 people uh, has COVID, according to ONS uh, data, the most recent that has been published. Uh, but there is now some leveling off in the cases. This is earlier in the bits of the country uh, which were in tier four for longest. Uh, but, it, but we are seeing some levelling off uh, everywhere, it, it, as far as we can see, uh, including the areas which uh, ended lockdown more recently. This is thanks to enormous efforts by so many people, and this is because a very high proportion of the population, virtually everyone, in fact, if you look at the polling data, is adhering to the guidance uh, and staying at home uh, and minimising the number of contacts they have. And this is leading to this impact. And we were not sure... This was going to be possible with this new variant, but this demonstrates that uh, with the actions everyone has taken, uh, we are now slowing this right down, and we hope it will, uh, in due course, start to drop. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, the number of people going into hospital lags behind the number of uh, people who actually catch the disease because there's a delay before hospitalization. So the number of people entering hospital is still rising in most parts of the country, and the number of people in hospital is still uh, rising uh, in most parts or all parts of the country because it takes a while for people uh, to be discharged. And what you can see here in this dotted line is the peak from the first wave uh, in April. Uh, and as you can see, we have well exceeded this. Uh, and my colleagues in the NHS are working incredibly hard uh, to care for all of these patients as well as everybody else who has other medical problems. And we want to re-stress uh, this evening that if you have any serious medical problems, uh, heart attacks, strokes, these kind of very major issues, the NHS, absolutely, you should be uh, contacting and hospital, uh, if appropriate, is where you should go. So this, uh, they are achieving this uh, and continuing to run the service, but there is very large numbers of people now in hospital and they will continue to rise probably uh, into next week. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, still later, sadly, some people die, and the number of deaths is, again, uh, rising steadily, and that will continue to rise uh, into next week because there's a lag between people going into hospital uh, and then, sadly, uh, some people dying, and you can see the data here. If we look forward over the next uh, few weeks, um, the effects of everyone's actions in helping to reduce transmission will begin to reduce this strong pressure of the virus and reduce uh, the pressure on the NHS and reduce the number of deaths. Uh, and uh, with a delay, uh, the fact that we're vaccinating the most vulnerable people, the people in care homes and in uh, above uh, 80 at the moment, it will in due course move slightly further down the age spectrum. These are the people who are at higher, highest risk of dying. And therefore the impact on reducing deaths from this vaccination program, astonishing vaccination program delivered by uh, the NHS, uh, will come first. The, imp the impact on reducing pressure on hospitals will uh, take longer because there is a younger age cohort in addition in hospital, uh, in addition to those older uh, citizens. So that is where things we hope will go over the next few weeks, but I'm afraid in the next week we do anticipate the number of uh, people in the NHS and the number of deaths will continue to rise as the effects of what everyone has done take a while to feed through. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. Let's go to questions from the public first. We got to Wayne from Bath, please. The new variant of the virus has been largely blamed for the current situation, including the ineffectiveness of the regional tiered approach, whilst the wide and damaging effects of a lockdown are acknowledged. What plans are the government putting in place to contain any potential future variant that is more easily transmissible or causes more severe disease, especially one that may require adjustments to the approved vaccines? Well, Wayne, thank you very much. I reckon you're asking the, uh, the question that so many people are asking in our country at the moment. We've made such progress with uh, the vaccine. Uh, what we don't want to see is all that hard work undone by the arrival of a, uh, a new variant that is uh, vaccine busting, as it were. So uh, a lot of work, uh, scientific work is being done on that. And I've just outlined some of the steps that uh, uh, we're, we're taking to uh, protect this country from the arrival of, uh, of new variants of concern from, from overseas. And you, you'll have heard 
uh, weighing what I had to say about the, the tough measures we're taking at, uh, at borders and at airports to, uh, to, uh, under, with quarantine uh, to stop new variants coming in. But I think possibly it'd be best to, to hand over to, to Chris and Patrick just to say a little bit about um, whether it, you know, wh how you can adjust vaccines to cope uh, with the new variants and the extent to which we think the existing vaccines we have in the UK are already uh, good uh, for, for reducing disease and reducing uh, mortality generally. Do you want to go there, Chris? Yes, yeah. well, um, Patrick, why don't uh, you go? First thing to say is, is in terms of detecting the, um, uh, the viruses, uh, we've got a very comprehensive um, screening program with genomics to get sequences of the virus. That's why we picked up the ones we have. So I think that needs to continue and to make sure we're on top of, uh, of actually finding these and then dealing with them early. In terms of the vaccines, the evidence at the moment that we've got in terms of the UK variant is that it transmits more readily. There's no obvious change in the disease course one way or the other, um, at least within sort of broad, broad areas. So there's nothing to suggest that there's a really big change in, in disease severity in any way. And in terms of the immunity, everything looks as though this variant will be susceptible to the immune response that's either come about from a previous infection or from vaccines. So there's accumulating evidence to suggest that. In terms of other variants, it's possible that, that variants will get round vaccines to some extent in the future, and, and some of them uh, that are out there in the world now may well have more of an effect to um, bypass some of the existing immune system um, that's come up in, term, uh, in response to a vaccine or... or um, uh, previous infection. We don't know that, um, but I think the vaccines themselves, and this is what I think is, is really important, is the new types of vaccines, particularly the messenger RNA vaccines, are really quite easy to adjust to changes in the virus. And that is a big change in vaccine technology. It's a very important advance. It's essentially days to make a new starting point, weeks probably to get to um, a new vaccine if it's needed, provided the regulators are happy uh, with, with the approach. But that is very different from the past. And it's worth also remembering that flu changes year on year, and that's why you need a different flu vaccine each year. So it's a similar sort of problem that we have going forward. As the viruses change, how do you make sure that the vaccine adjusts accordingly over years? Um, and I think it's likely that the vaccine that we have now is going to protect against, um, uh, say, the UK variant and is going to provide protection against, I suspect, the other variants as well. The question is just to what degree um, the efficacy might have been, might change a bit, and that's, that's what we've got to find out. The, the only thing I'd add to what uh, Sir Patrick has said is that the, um, we shouldn't, we must see this as an international problem. So we're concentrating absolutely on trying to protect people here in the UK, but it is also important, as we are, that we actually also support every nation because a problem anywhere is a problem everywhere with a virus like this. Uh, so improving, helping to improve diagnostics, helping to make sure vaccines are both researched, which the UK has taken a very significant lead in, but also distributed and available and uh, resourced, uh, which is done through, for example, uh, a, a system called COVAX. So there's several things we should be doing to support everyone as in, in, internationally as well as uh, nationally. That is completely right, and the, and the problem, I guess, will, will only really be solved once the, the whole uh, global population is, has some, some uh, measure of vaccination and, uh, uh, and immunity. And the UK contributes massively to, uh, to COVAX and, and CEPI and other global uh, vaccine initiatives. Uh, let's go to Michael from Cornwall. Good evening. What will the number of daily death rates and COVID-19 infections will the government consider lifting the lockdown restrictions? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael. I think that that's a, uh, an incredibly, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's a question everybody uh, is, has been thinking about for a long time. I think the, the answer is that we want to get to a, a stage where we're confident that we've uh, vaccinated uh, the, as I say, the, uh, the JCVI one to four cohorts, uh, the, uh, those in care homes, care home workers, NHS staff, uh, those over 80, those over, uh, over 70, uh, and so on. The, the most vulnerable groups, uh, we've got to do them. Uh, and uh, then depending on the effectiveness of that rollout, and as you know, we're, we're going for 
uh, we're hoping to do uh, all of them by the 15th of, of February, uh, we will think about what uh, steps we could take to, uh, to uh, lift the uh, restrictions. But it will also depend on where the disease is and what's happening, because uh, what we can't have, and I'd, I'd like Chris and Patrick to, to comment on this as well, what we can't have is any false sense of security so that we, uh, as it were, lift the uh, restrictions altogether, and then the disease really runs riot uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the younger generations. And uh, as you know at the moment, I think about uh, a, a third of those in going into hospital were under uh, 65 and ab about a quarter under uh, 55 from, from memory. I, 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 Patrick uh, and Chris and Patrick may want to correct me on that. And so it can affect and does affect huge numbers of uh, younger people as well, uh, often very badly. And uh, the risk is that those numbers would be greatly inflated uh, if, we, if we let go too soon in circumstances where the disease uh, was, really, uh, was really rampant. That is not to say, uh, Michael, uh, that we don't want or that I don't want to try to get to uh, relaxations as soon as we reasonably can, but there's a, a lot of things that have to go right. We have to make sure the vaccine program uh, is working well. The, the, we have to make sure that there are no new variants or no uh, big changes in our understanding of the, of the disease. And we've got to work together to deliver the, uh, the results of the current lockdown and, and get the disease under control. And there are, there are some signs in some places that that is working, but it's going to take a, a huge national effort. Well, the two things just to add to what the Prime Minister said. I mean, the first is a point he's made before, uh, and I think which is, which is in a sense common sense, which is we're not going to move from a sudden lockdown situation to nothing. It will have to be walking backwards by degrees, testing what works, and then if that works, going, more, uh, going the next step. Uh, the second thing is that uh, all the way through this, we've talked about the fact that there, is, there, are there are direct effects from COVID deaths, and we hope that vaccination will help to reduce those very substantially. But there are also indirect effects from a situation where the NHS could become really under pressure and all the other, uh, other things like cancer and cardiovascular, uh, heart disease and stroke services, for example, are really, in, uh, really affected. So we've got not only to reduce the direct effects, we've also got to make sure there's sufficient uh, uh, ability for the NHS to treat all these other things, or we could have a significant health problem, uh, which in a sense was just knock, a knock-on from the fact that people who are not likely to die of COVID but have very severe COVID are in hospital mean that we can't treat other things. So it's, we need to just always think about those other areas of health as well. So, Michael, it's not that the death rate isn't important. It is important. We will, of course, uh, uh, consider it, but it's just one of the factors that we've got to, to, to bear in mind. It's, it's, it's the rate of the disease and the risk of, a, of another really huge uh, spike of infection as well. Let's go to Hugh, Hugh Pym of the BBC. You need, you need to unmute. Apologies. Thank you, Prime Minister. Some hospitals in London and the southeast of England are so stretched that patients are having to be moved hundreds of miles for treatment. Does this not suggest that not enough was done by the government to prepare the NHS for the second wave? And for Professor Whitty and Sir Patrick, when exactly do you expect the peak of pressure on the NHS to be and how might that vary around the country? And how do you see the trajectory of cases going from now? Well, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, obviously, a, a huge amount was done to uh, prepare uh, the NHS for, and has uh, continuously for the last uh, year uh, since the, the, the pandemic became apparent. And we always knew that we were going to have a particularly tough time now. And actually, even in, uh, in, the, in London, where the situation has been toughest uh, the, the, the London NHS uh, has been under huge, huge, huge pressure, but they really have been coping magnificently. And uh, the, the ICU uh, capacity has not uh, yet been overwhelmed in, in the way that perhaps uh, some of us feared it, it might be. And that is thanks to the, the hard work and the professionalism of the, uh, of the staff, the doctors and nurses of, uh, of the NHS. Uh, the, the answer, and we are seeing, as I, as I said just now, some tentative early signs uh, that the pressure may be slightly easing uh, in London now, but it is far too early to be remotely confident uh, about that. And 
uh, we need to make sure that we uh, keep the, the discipline and the, and the focus and the, and the lockdown, stay at home and protect the NHS. Uh, in answer to your question, um, to us, the peak of the, uh, to Patrick and me, um, uh, we expect the peak of the infections to occur, uh, we hope, uh, already has happened uh, in some parts of the country, particularly uh, southeast, east of England and London, where there was initially a really big surge with the new variant. Uh, and it is fantastic that that is beginning to happen, and thanks to what everyone has done. Um, uh, other areas that went into lockdown a bit later, the peak of infections will be later, but the peak of uh, hospitalizations is delayed usually by maybe a around a week from the peak of infections. That's pushed because it takes a while between people first getting infected to getting ill enough to go to hospital. So that peak will be a bit later in every area of the country, a bit later than the peak of infections. And then the peak of deaths, unfortunately, is a bit later still. So the peak of deaths, I fear, is in the future the peak of hospitalizations in some parts of the country uh, may be around about now and come, beginning to come off the very, very top, but at an incredibly high rate, and I cannot stress that enough. And because a lot of people are going to stay in hospital, the peak of people in hospital is later than the peak of ho people coming into hospital. So that peak, again, will be slightly delayed. Uh, and uh, in parts of the, particularly the north and the southwest, for example, the peak will be later than it is uh, in, 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 in east of England southeast and in London. Uh, but all of these, because people are sticking so well to the guidelines, uh, we do think uh, that uh, the peaks are coming over the next probably uh, a week to 10 days for mo most places in terms of new people into hospital. That would be the expectation. The, the only thing I, I would add to that is it's worth remembering this is not a natural peak that's going to come down on its own. It's coming down because of the measures that are in place. Take the lid off now, this is going to boil over for sure and we'll end up with a big problem. And that is a lesson, I think, about making sure it's all cooled down enough before you get to that position. So I don't think we should view the peak as a natural turning point of the disease. It is a suppressed peak that we need to keep on top of. Thanks very much, Hugh. Uh, Libby Veen, ITV. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, we've been in this pandemic for the best part of a year. Why on earth is it only now that you're putting in proper controls at the border? Isn't this yet another example of uh, acting too late, uh, which could cost lives? And could I also ask Sir Patrick Valance, uh, do you think the Brazilian vari variant is here already? Uh, or have we done enough by locking down uh, the borders overnight to stop it? Uh, well, no, well, obviously, Libby, the, what we're doing now is uh, taking steps that you'd expect to protect against the, uh, the new variants, because what we've got a situa is a situation now is where we, we have a very high rate of, uh, of as, as it were, domestic infection uh, in the UK, combined with a massive vaccination program. And as uh, Chris and Patrick have been saying, there's going to come a point, uh, we hope, in the next few weeks and months when the vaccination program will really start to take an effect. Uh, and, and large numbers of people, the, the effect, and that effect will be that so many people are, are vaccinated that uh, you do start to see a, a decline in the, uh, in the death rate, and that will be incredibly important and encouraging when it happens. So at this crucial stage, what we can't have is uh, new variants with uh, unknown uh, uh, qualities uh, coming in uh, from abroad, and that's why we've set up the, uh, the system to to, to stop arrivals from places where there are new variants of, uh, of concern and uh, set up the, uh, the, the, the extra tough measures that, that, that I've outlined. I think in, in terms of variants, it's, it's worth remembering this virus is, is changing all the time, like all viruses do, and I suspect there are variants all over the world of different types. Um, and uh, it's important to note that the countries that have detected them first are the countries that have both got good sequencing, so they've sequenced a lot of viruses, and they've been open and said, yes, we've got, we've got um, variants, as we've done here. So I think, I think we should be careful not to assume those are the only places that the variants are. In terms of the Brazilian variant, there are really two major ones from um, Brazil, one of them which is particularly important. It contains two changes, one, one at 484 and one at 501, so two positions in the genetic sequence. Um, that one has not yet been detected in, in, in the UK as far as I'm aware, um, but you know we've got to keep monitoring carefully and it could of course come from any place around the world and these are changes which I would expect to start seeing in lots of places. These are changes which this virus quite likes 
and uh, I think we'll see them um, uh, emerging in different places. Thanks, Libby. Uh, ben Kentish, LBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, last week on the vaccine, you promised the maximum possible transparency. And yet in the days since, the government has said it will not produce the key statistic at the moment, given this is the limiting factor, and that is the supply. So in the interest of that transparency, and clearly things are going well, but we have heard some reports of wastage and of GPs surgeries not getting the supplies they were promised. In the interest of that transparency, could you tell us how many doses are available now and how many will be in February? And then just quickly, if I could, one for Professor Whitty. Uh, Professor, you've said before that you thought things would be uh, back to normal much more than they are now by Easter. Do you still think that's the case or realistically are we now looking at the summer? And a quick one for Patrick Valance too. Uh, Sir Patrick, according to Public Health England, there were more outbreaks in workplaces than there were in hospitals, care homes or prisons in the last week. Has SAGE looked at the problem of workplace transmission and does it think more needs to be done to keep people safe if they are going to work? Thank you all. Um, ben, can I just come back on the, on the, on the vaccine supply issue? And I think you, you, you really need to, 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 to look at what we're saying on, uh, on where, what we think we can do on getting jabs into, into arms. Because when you, when you look at the, 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 the issue of the number of vials or the number of, of doses, there are, there, are, there are things that uh, there's the overall question of uh, can the factories, we've got two vaccines we're using at the moment, as, as you know, uh, Pfizer and the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, that we, we depend on them, uh, their factories, their uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, and also there is the issue of the, uh, the, the batch testing the approvals uh, that, uh, that have to be done to make sure that we're putting safe vaccine in, in everybody's arms. I think it's incredibly important that uh, all our vaccines are, are safe. Uh, so we've got to get all that right. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that uh, we're using all the supply that uh, uh, we uh, can possibly lay our uh, hands on. And, uh, and uh, you know, the UK secured bigger supplies than, than any other uh, country. Uh, and we're going to get it into people's arms as fast as possible. And the, the, the ambition is, as you know, by uh, the um, uh, 15th of February uh, to have got uh, 12 million uh, people in England offered a, uh, a, a first vaccine, uh, 15 million across the UK. Those are, those are the best figures I can give you. On, on, on terms of the question you asked me, I mean, I've, I've always said that I thought there was a reasonable chance things would be a lot better in the spring. I, I, I haven't, don't recall I've ever personally said that it was in the, uh, by Easter uh, in public, but I think the, the Prime Minister may have quoted me as saying that rather generously, but, uh, but let's, uh, let's assume that we just take talk about the spring more generously. It was the spring after Easter. Yes. There is a spring after Easter, yes. Okay. Uh, so more, more generally, but the general okay. principle that things are actually are going to improve in the spring, I, I still think that is very likely. Having had the new, having the new variant, makes that harder, there's no doubt about that. But I think what has happened over the last three weeks is we have shown that uh, with people's, everybody working together, we can beat this virus with the current measures and the vaccine will now help us to do that. And hopefully increasingly the vaccine will take the heavy lifting and less and less of this will be, re be requiring people to do things. But I think what no one thinks, and I think anybody who looks at this would agree with this, is that suddenly in spring it's all over and that's the whole thing done. What we expect is things to be substantially better than they are at the moment, both in terms of deaths from COVID and hopefully if we take it steadily and uh, in a sensible way walking backwards from uh, restrictions, but in a way that actually keeps the deaths down, the NHS uh, not under pressure. So certainly the hope is that that's a kind of reasonable time frame to be kind of thinking about. Uh, but I think if we try and put a hard stop on this, of course we'll, we'll be caught out by events. But I think that broad time frame still feels to me a reasonable one, provided what we're not expecting is completely back to what it would have been two springs ago. It's going to be, it's going to, you know, it's going to be a lot better than we are now. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. There was a question about workplaces. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Yes, that's very so, important. Yes, um, so I think a lot of workplaces have done a great job in terms of making sure that they are safe and they've, they've gone as far as possible in terms of distancing and the other measures and, and hand hygiene and surface cleaning and all the things that, that, that really matter. And yes, SAGE has looked at this and produced a number of guidance papers on how best to think about this 
in the workplace. Uh, so they're there in the public domain for people to look at. And uh, from that, the departments have drawn up um, specific guidance and HSE and other um, organisations have. But yes, SAGE has produced papers on workplace safety and, and how to optimise uh, conditions to try and reduce the spread of the uh, virus. Just on that, I think it's, I, I said earlier on, I think it is very important for people not to uh, just get fixated on, on uh, exhalations, you know, uh, transmission uh, by standing near somebody. Um, don't forget it can also be transmitted and, and it very likely is very commonly and widely transmitted by uh, handling things and, and picking up something that's been touched by somebody who's infected. I think we, we, we forget uh, that in, in, in the way that we're, uh, we're trying to restrict transmission. It's very important uh, to remember that. Uh, let's go to, to, and that's why the hand washing message is, is also so, uh, so important. Let's go to Seb Payne of the FT. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I would like to ask you about what happens to the rest of society once the most vulnerable are vaccinated. Are you not giving us any indications about vaccinating the under 50s because you're intending to open up society before the point you will get to them? And will this be safe for the working age population, given how little we know about the long term impacts of COVID? For Professor Whitty, um, there are some reports that GP surgeries and vaccination centres have spare vaccines once appointments are complete and they risk being thrown away at the end of the day. So what is the government's plan for excess vaccines and what are the protocols for how they should be used or should GPs give them to whoever turns up? And finally for Sir Patrick, there was a recent poll out that said just 5% of Britons have heard advice about avoiding unventilated indoor places. We know this is a key way to avoid COVID being transmitted. So why isn't the government's education campaign focusing on this front? Thank you all. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Seb. And you are, I think, like actually several uh, questioners already this, e this afternoon, focusing on the, the, the issue that I think really preoccupies so many of us at the moment. Uh, what is the, the, the moment at which we think it might be safe uh, to, uh, to relax? How, what proportion of the, of the population of the vulnerable uh, do we need to have immunized in order to be able to, to start that journey of, of relaxation? It was, as Chris just said, it will be uh, a process. I think let's let's focus for now on uh, getting that uh, those cohorts, the J the JCVI groups uh, one to four coming forward, the over 80s, uh, the over 70s, and uh, uh, as I, as I've as I've said, uh, and I think that that will already make a huge difference. Uh, but clearly, uh, as, as Chris and Patrick have said, there will be more work to be done to immunise uh, the rest of the population uh, to to make us even, even safer and, and, and allow us to open up even more. It's probably about as, as specific as I can be, uh, Seb, tonight, but there, there's clearly a, a, a debate to be had and we'll make sure that uh, everybody has a chance to, to have their say in that debate. Um, on the question you asked me, I mean, GP, I mean, let's move from anecdote to actual numbers. If you look at the proportion of the uh, vaccines that have been uh, used, which are for people in care homes, and people over 80, it is the overwhelming majority. But at the same time, GPs rightly have tried to make sure that they eke every vaccine out that they can. And there has been some perfectly sensible decisions made by individual GPs and not just GPs, also elsewhere, uh, where it looks as if, particularly with the uh, Pfizer vaccine, where there is an issue about shelf life once something's being unfrozen, uh, to make sure that actually uh, it's possible to maximize the number of people vaccinated. But they have really heavily concentrated in these top tiers uh, for the JCVI identified, those over 80 and those in care homes at the moment, plus health and social care workers who are in contact with patients uh, uh, for very obvious reasons. Uh, and the reason for that is really also very clear, which is those are the people who are at the greatest risk. So that's why that heavy concentration has gone that way. But where, where, they, where there has been extra, people have been very sensible about it. And new things are coming in, for example, to try and uh, increase by one dose, the number of doses you can get per vial, uh, other ways of trying to make, make sure we are as efficient as possible in ensuring that we get as minimum wastage as possible. Because as you rightly say, the thing which is limiting at this at the moment is not the capacity of the NHS to deliver, it's the vaccines to deliver. And that's something which we kind of, that's true across Europe, it's true across the world. Uh, and it's something which all of us need to do is to make sure we use the vaccines we've got as efficiently as possible. 
And, and, and sorry, you, you, you're quite right to raise indoor spaces. I mean, it's indoors where most of the transmission occurs. It's indoors where the biggest risk occurs. And it's indoors where we've all got to be really careful about not mixing with people, not getting into crowded situations, keeping a distance, making sure we uh, look after hand hygiene, and, of course, the point that you raised, ventilation. And that's been uh, a recommendation, and, and, and there have been several pieces of work on that, uh, suggesting that you've really got to try and keep ventilation open windows, simple things that you can do to try and make sure that there's adequate ventilation. So all of those measures uh, matter, and indoors is a particularly risky place in that respect, mixing with people who may be infected. Thanks, Seb. But Martin Brown of The Express. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, despite the incredible achievements with the vaccine rollout, there are concerns in some care homes that it's taking longer than expected. So um, what, step, what are you doing um, to help speed this up to prevent a, sur a worrying surge in deaths in care homes? Um, and also, do you think now that um, we've made such good progress on the vaccination rollout that your target of reaching um, all the over 80s will be hit sooner rather than later? And um, Professor Valence, just wondered if you could um, tell me uh, how soon will it be before we know what effect um, the vaccinations will have on transmission rates? Are there any indications with the evidence you have so far? And what, what would you normally expect um, to happen to transmission rates once programmes are in place for other respiratory diseases? Uh, Martin, your question is absolutely the, the right one. You're, you're right to focus on care homes. We remember what happened in the first stage of the, of the pandemic, and uh, clearly you, we've got a problem there uh, again. Um, that's why we're working flat out to, to vaccinate uh, care home uh, workers and, and care home residents. And uh, the, the, I, 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 the, from memory, I think we've done 100,000 uh, elderly, elderly care home residents, the most vulnerable uh, care home uh, residents, uh, and uh, a great many care home staff as well. Uh, so I think about 40% of the elderly care home residents will be done. And we hope, uh, Martin, uh, to have <coughs> completed the care homes uh, by the end of the month, uh, which I think will make a, make a, make a huge difference. And um, there, there, there is, there is, I, I can't give you a, a date for the delivering, and I've given you the deadline of, of February the 15th, but be, before that, a, a date by which we hope to have delivered of uh, given all the over 80s the, the, the a slot for a, for a vaccine. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, give you one in advance of February the 15th, except to say there are some places in the country that are really shooting the, the lights out and doing an amazing job. Uh, as I said earlier on, you know, some places have really uh, got uh, you know, 80, 90 percent of their, of their 80 year olds already done. And when you consider uh, the, the huge proportion of deaths that sadly uh, take place amongst those groups, uh, elderly uh, people in care homes uh, and the over 80s. You can see what a potential difference uh, this, this early action could make to the, to the death rate. In terms of the vaccine effects, I mean, the vaccines, and, and it's worth just still taking a step back, and it, it is a miracle we've got vaccines this quickly, actually, and so many different vaccines coming along. The vaccines are good at reducing the things that we were talking about now, so deaths, severe disease, hospitalizations and symptomatic disease. We know that, they've got good effects there. It's much more difficult to pick up the effect on transmission. There are studies going on which will reveal that information. Um, so we will expect to get information on that. And of course you get information as the vaccines roll out. Um, but it would be very surprising for vaccines that are this effective not to have a decent effect on transmission. Now, I'm not going to put a number on it, but you'd expect them to have some effect on transmission uh, and therefore, um, uh, as more people get vaccinated for that transmission to be more difficult for the virus. But I don't think it will be, with the vaccines we've got, I don't think it will be complete suppression of transmission. I think there will still be transmission. Um, and that's important to remember, which means that just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you can't catch this and pass it on. It means that you're protected against severe disease and, and th therefore we shouldn't go mad when people start getting vaccinated and assume that everything's okay and you can't pass it on, you can't catch it or give it to somebody else. Uh, that still will be the case. So we've got to be cautious as we go through this, but I expect the vaccines to have an effect on transmission reduction. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Martin. Jamie Kapash of uh, Pulse magazine. 
Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, something you touched on earlier, um, we've been hearing plenty of reports about deliveries to GP centres being uh, delayed and cancelled, which has led to GPs having to cancel patients for their elderly, most vulnerable patients, uh, obviously causing quite a bit of distress. So can I firstly ask what you're doing to smooth this process? And secondly, can I ask what action you're taking to ensure that individual GP practices can start administering the vaccine to their own patients, um, the, the, the patients they know best? Uh, thanks very much, Jamie. I think the, the, the crucial thing is obviously that everybody gets down to their, uh, their vaccination centre, to, to the hospital, to the, uh, the, 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 the primary care network, wherever the, uh, the local pharmacy, uh, wherever the vaccination is being offered, when they get the, uh, the, the message to come for your vaccine. You've got, it's, very, it's a, a wonderful thing and, and people, people should go. Um, I do think that it's, it's also very important that uh, the, uh, when we have the problem of, of some groups or some people not getting the message, perhaps uh, being, uh, being a bit uh, uh, reluctant to, to go for one reason or another, that we all work to, to, to make it clear this is a, a great thing to do. And uh, local councils, uh, I believe, uh, uh, can, and uh, public health directors uh, in, in local councils will know uh, where to find uh, people who, who uh, may be hard to reach and I can believe a bit of, I, I, and they can be of massive massive uh, help so what we've got is an integrated system where the uh, where, where if people don't come and we're not getting uh, people getting to the uh, the vaccination centers in the way that uh, that we want uh, then there are other ways of uh, reaching out to them and ensuring that they get the the jabs that they need that's that's it's a it's it, it, we've got the the army we've got pharmacies uh, we've got local councils and we've got uh, we've got the nhs but the crucial thing is for people uh, to go down and get a vaccine if they're offered one can i just add one thing to my colleagues in general practice which is a massive thank you they've put up with uh, in, enormous amounts of uh, strain over the last over the whole of the pandemic uh, and they've now stood up the vaccination on top of everything else they're doing. So it, I think we should all be enormously grateful for what they have done, including some quite rapid turns of policy when it actually uh, we've had to do that and people have actually been very understanding of this. So I, you just, I just want to thank my colleagues enormously. Uh, and I would totally echo that. And the GPs are, are doing an, an unbelievable job. Some of them do, are doing as many vaccinations as a, as a whole hospital in, uh, in, in GP surgeries. They're absolutely in incredible. And uh, as Chris has just said, uh, they executed the change to the, uh, to the, to the delayed second jab uh, policy very, very well. And, uh, and that's, that's more or less totally uh, transformed. So the, the numbers are... Uh, are good today. There will be bumpy days ahead. It will be. Uh, it will continue to be. Uh, to be, you know, up and down as we as we roll out this uh, this vaccine. But I just want everybody to know uh, that we're doing absolutely everything we can, uh, throwing everything at it at the the vaccination campaign. And in the meantime, uh, as we as we race against time, it is absolutely vital that people uh, follow the guidance, uh, stay at home, protect the NHS. Thank you all very much.